morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Rekhi. I am the uh, board member of KPMG Dubai, and I used to be the CEO of KPMG in India. Uh, today's topic is very interesting. It is succession planning stimulated by the COVID panic. Uh, uh, we have with us. I will introduce the panel members very shortly, but we have with us uh, a very eminent panel. Uh, there's a founder. There is uh, a person who advises family offices. We have got a lawyer, and then we have got uh, somebody who is married into a into an uh, into a, a place where they run a large family office in Japan, and we'll we'll understand from uh, you know each of them as to how. So we've got practitioners out here who will give you certain kind of advice, etc. So COVID nineteen <clears throat> has had an impact on business of every size. In every region in the world, family businesses are no exception. Actually, there was a big point which was coming up: whether the typical family office uh, or family businesses, which are very resilient, they're very agile and they're very entrepreneurial, whether this spirit will be able to navigate them more successfully than others uh, during this unpredictable global crisis, which we are still in. Actually, uh, family businesses, as we all know, play a very vital role in the economy of anywhere in the world. They contribute a large amount to the GDP of the country, and they are large employers of the global workforce. So, uh, it, so it has been predicted that the family businesses are primed to be the engine of global economic recovery from COVID-19, and uh, we will hear some of it from the panelists out here. Uh, uh, the family offices are conservative. Some of them are very conservative, so they were waiting and watching what's going to happen. But, however, when they understood it, I think they uh, they were very quick to take action and move forward on it. Uh, uh, COVID nineteen just magnified the importance of succession planning. It was already there, but it only really just magnified it, and is very crucial for uh, family offices or family enterprises to ask the questions. What if something happens to the CEO? Is the next generation ready to step in? Do we all agree on a vision and legacy that we want to leave behind? And how do we fund the business and care for the stakeholders? Next gen members who have been very highly educated in the Western world and are aware of new global structures and new ways of operating, they have innovative ideas for the future. And younger generations are starting to influence the way family offices are investing as they bring new ideas to the table. Market trends show that succession, succession planning is becoming an important part of consideration in these unprecedented times. Uh, in coming years, many family offices are expected to devolve their holdings to the next generation. It need, however, it needs to be done with minimum disruption. Uh, according to Knight Frank Attitude Survey 2021, India is among the top four countries where the ultra wealthy Indians. Have reassessed their attitude to succession planning in the light of COVID-19 pandemic. Apart from uh, succession planning in family offices, it was imperative that the family office to relook at their corporate succession planning. Who will succeed the CEO and the CFO? According to the survey, four in ten family offices are significantly reassessing their financial strategy as a result of COVID-19, and only 45% of the millennials currently feel prepared to run the family business. So this is a challenge. This is something that will we can discuss during this panel. In general, succession planning should not be an extraordinary event, but rather a well-established process as part of business as usual. Uh, when the pandemic struck, family business faced with a black swan event, like most uh, other businesses. While this was a crisis, it also presented an opportunity to go digital. In fact, we hear about some of this and. Uh, they were going to go digital under any case but however digital transformation has helped various business to run their operations smoothly uh, families also learned to have sufficient cash reserves in the business to cushion situations of uh, cash flow or revenue going down one way we see family office successfully transition wealth is clarifying their values their investments the management principles and building a shared vision of the future so the family uh, commits itself to an identity. In this pandemic year, and uh, you know, there has been a lot of talk that there is going to be an expected levy of inheritance tax in India, and this is going to directly impact the succession plans of HNIs and ultra high net worth individuals. 
Uh, however, there is a strong requirement for guidance for not only setting up family offices in India, but also for succession planning to ensure a smooth transition of ownership and wealth inheritance. Worldwide liquidity measures and easing of financial stress have aided many of the family offices. There is no better time than this for transfer of assets at markdown prices during the pandemic, and it may be an efficient mode of devolution of assets to the next generation. Now, with the vaccination drive well on way, implemented in many countries pretty well, and the global econ economic recovery showing surfaces, green shoots out here, it may be an ideal period for the family offices to facilitate inclusion of the younger generation. We will be discussing the evolving phase of the family offices in today's time, importance of succession planning, and other aspects in today's panel. Like I said, we have a very imminent panel. Let me introduce them to you. We have Dr. Neha Berilia, who is a member of the management board of the Apogee Group. Um, she is a graduate in economics from Stanford and a PhD in finance from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Um, uh, she, the Apogee Group, is very well known in uh, known uh, uh, in uh, for the education institutions, pharmaceutical and real estate business, and she looks after real estate business from day-to-day -day operations, related activities and various business verticals in the group. The next we uh, have Mark Mueller, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of uh, Aditech Corporation USA. Mark spends most of his time managing his own family affairs, and he also helps other family offices advising them, advising entrepreneurs, investment in funds, and he's an advisor and board member. He's a, uh, he's a member of the several angel groups, and a strong affinity with the crypto. We hear something about the crypto from it. It's a very interesting asset class which family offices may want to look at. Then we have Shua Mandal, who is the managing partner of Fox Mandal and Associates. Uh, the firm is celebrating 125 years in India. It's possibly one of the oldest law firms in the country. And he's the fourth generation lawyer. Uh, his focus is on corporate m and and also uh, family businesses. He advises uh, various companies. And we know, uh, I know for certain that a lot of this restructuring is happening. And uh, uh, so he's helping them set up governance structures, restructuring their businesses, new investment and succession planning, amongst other things. Uh, last but not the least, we have Tatsuya Masubushi, who's the chief executive officer of High Net Worth Lab Japan, a lifestyle management company based in Tokyo which offers lifestyle services such as succession, schooling, and finding some rare luxury travel, uh, which itself is a luxury in today's time, travel. So you must be really giving some innovative ideas to mainly Japanese high net worth individual families. He's married into a family where his wife comes from. They were the people who set up this cup noodle company, and uh, they're very high net worth individuals. And he's been advising them and also other families. So he brings his experience uh, of uh, advising in his own uh, family. So I will start now by first going to Shua, because we like to understand the uh, Indian landscape. So can you, uh, Shua, can you talk about the difficulties faced by the Indian family offices while doing succession planning? Thanks, Richard for your generous introduction and good morning to all of you. In India, the family business ecosystem varies in size and age. Family business, as you know, is generally considered as well. The, the growth as of the Indian families generally grow their wealth as in the business as well as the families. The large family business survive legacy of generations notwithstanding the MNC, MNCs which are coming to India and giving competition and also with the private equity funds which are trying to invest in India. But as you rightly said, Richard, the pandemic has really changed our thought process. The, the families have seen the problems they are facing and they are realizing that the succession planning is very important. The family owners realize that with creating and preserving wealth comes the responsibility. Therefore, in my opinion, all families need to understand the difference between succession in family, succession in business, and succession to ownership. Each of these aspects must be looked at differently 
and address differently. I would now like to highlight some of these issues that come up during the succession planning. Planning itself is a very important thing. As you know, that the, the, the old generation wants, needs to ensure that the transition happens in time and not at last minute, which is generally happening in most of these fa Indian families. Because in India, the families, the old generation do not want to do have a retirement age and do not pass the uh, remain as the head of the family till the last moment so that the next generation cannot demonstrate the leadership quality. The research also shows that the uh, old generation approaches the issues on an emotional to succession, putting the blood before the business and not the things which I mentioned earlier, succession in family, succession to business and succession to ownership. Next, I would like to highlight that the, there is a tricky situation of balancing the modern aspiration of the next generation and conservative outlook of the old generation. The next generation generally comes, has good education doing the an experience which they have got abroad and they have come back to India, but they cannot take any action because the old generation still wants to control the business. The old generation tries to old generation tries to maintain the royalty and the credibility of obedience, which the which is basically the confidentiality and the adverse to the consultants. They do not trust the professionals with the contrary views. As you know, that the when the uh, consultants come in, they give what is the hard and the unwanted information should not come out to public. They are worried that if these come out, it will be problem. Then the next issues which they face is the percentage of holding, not diluting the shares. The old generation generally prefers that if they're earning profit, why should I dilute shares? On the other hand, the next generation feels that they should dilute the shares. They do not want to use all their wealth, the money they have earned in their business. They want to dilute the shares, bring peas so that they can invest in other businesses. The new generation tries to feel that this is very important. The, the, uh, the difference needs to be discussed and they have to address it. Lastly, the pain points which they face is reputation, effectiveness and wealth creation. Different aspect and there is a generation gap. Finally, I would like to say that it is all about compromise, whether how they talk to each other and discuss this issue. You should, you all now understand that these issues are complex and should be decided during the succession planning. You all should remember that communication is the key. That's what I wanted to say in this issue. Richard, over to back to you. Thank you, Shiva. Communication is the key. And thank you very much for your comments. I think there were uh, some good points there. Uh, Neha, may I come to you? Uh, Neha, you are from a promoter family. And you, like you were telling us earlier, that you've been in, in the business from when you were very young. And uh, when other children were going to school, you were sitting there, various interviews, etc. Uh, but, uh, and dealing with the, you're dealing with a vast segment of the business. And as a woman entrepreneur and as a, uh, this thing, how did you manage the manpower intensive business uh, which you are looking after cons uh, cons uh, currently? And considering the pandemic has impacted India quite severely. Okay, um, thank you, Richard, and thank you for the introduction as well. Um, so I would like to start, like, you know, the manpower business in India is a little bit, um, uh, is different compared to other countries. So uh, I think during COVID, the, the way I work, I, I have been doing business when I came, I studied abroad and I came back, has been a lot of face-to-face -face interactions with people. So even at all levels, especially even manpower, I think they need to see the confidence uh, one has and what I quickly realized that, that you have these managers and you have the other managers and then you have all these people working in different sites and so I'm talking about civil employees I'm talking about administration and at this level of people they need to see I mean they do need to see a face so where we had very good managers things worked very well where we you know where things 
were getting lost where you know where the, the higher management or the higher managerial level wasn't very strong so uh, the way i got my efficiency always in our business was uh, having a very direct communication so when i used to be in the office i would have a meeting or i would have a phone call or i have i would be in touch directly and that incre- it increased the output I and mean, that would mean a lot more time from me but that really added a lot of value to the business i mean a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion and debate on how much time one should put uh, with different you know different levels of people but uh, during the pandemic you know we were all abroad as a family and you know we had to manage a large set of businesses and keep people motivated uh, and working so i mean what happened in covid i mean especially the first year it was there was a lockdown there were people uh, uh, struggling and there were some manpower intensive like construction for example it was totally stopped and then there were these people who were scared and there was a lot of fear that what's going to happen are we going to get paid uh, we're not you know and then there was this whole disconnect between the office and these people on the site and i think what really worked for us was um, i had to immediately buy a lot of mobile phones a lot of you know zoom ids and and internet connections and all that and immediately gave it to a lot of people who could not even understand how to use a phone so there were there were people in india especially who couldn't uh, who he didn't really write in english and then i i made that effort personally also of course our teams to make sure that they have the access to all these devices they are able to get on a zoom call they are able to see a video and i think uh, to be honest like uh, covid took its time but having these people the, all these segments of uh, various people on the on calls helped us a great deal because what i realized that people were motivated so um, uh we had for example normally we would do a call of like 3 4 people and we discuss a strategy for a particular site but uh during covid what happened is that put everybody on the call so we had like a video which was happening between 50 people 100 people 80 people and uh it became a lot more easier to be more efficient uh and what we learned was that you know by seeing video uh, by people having to be on video i think it it motivated a lot of these people on the ground and who were civil team manager they were supervisors they were all kinds of, and these people are actually they deliver crores of projects they can deliver, deliver pro- projects worth millions and so somewhere you know uh, it, it it taught me at least i would say that the whole importance of kind of being connected so we thought we were very connected uh, pre covid but i mean post covid i think what I, i i learned especially personally was that this kind of system where we are in touch personally and through a video or a technology medium this is key and critical in the future as well and um and personally speaking i think this was uh, uh I, i think this was something we learned and i still do it right now and now in the second part of covid what happened i mean this going to man part was that there was actual panic right in april where we had uh uh Uh, but generally speaking a lot of people died and then there was a different type of panic and i think personally what worked for us during this time was of course like motivating people and being there but we did uh, i was on the phone every day so basically calling and talking and you know that meant like i think i had 3 hours sleep nights during especially that peak time where i was pretty much on the phone with people and their families and making sure we are there for them and and what i what that resulted in it gave a lot of confidence uh, to our staff who worked for us and what happened and people you know stayed uh once things got over they bounced back very quickly and they started to work i mean for succession planning just going to the man part part you know just uh, to, uh just to to add here is i think what i learned personally was to have multiple people doing the same role so when you have a big organization and you have especially in in, in administration we had now we by being on these calls i could substitute people very easily so we had to do a lot of like last minute changes in the night being like okay this person's unwell you go this person died you know that also happened and okay this person's going to take over uh, things and that's kind of the institutional succession planning which we had to we started to now focus on a lot more and i think we're still evolving with it but i mean that's what uh, uh, we did so i think i'm yeah, thank, thank you, you. <clears throat> thank you neha i think you've given some good inputs for the audience and for all of us actually uh, two things i learned, i took away from here one was going digital uh, where you made everybody digital savvy and the number two was direct communication a fantastic point that during this time you need to be in touch with your people and that creates a huge amount of confidence thank you uh, mark may i come to you now you are from the uh, german who lives in america who has uh, built who has understood a lot of new asset classes you have you have you have been brave you have got into areas where we all feel scared uh, the west has had a pretty strong succession planning for the family offices generally for the last many years because it is evolved mm-hmm. and what are the do's and don'ts for the people who are looking to set up a family office because here we are talking to a very much indian audience mm-hmm. uh, for looking to set up a family office and what can be learned from the west and also how can the ingredients that go into creating a family office 
values outlive the original founder, which Shoa was talking about. How does those those values outlive the founder? Yeah, Mark. No, I think those are those are really interesting questions we are all still struggling with. I don't think there's a there's an answer, but I'm happy to share what I've learned uh, uh, over the last couple of decades for sure in that space. Um, I think um, it's interesting when Nia was show, uh, sharing. I think her experience. This, me coming from a technology background, I'm in the IT business for 30 years. Um, it was actually interesting. We had most of our business for the last, I would say, more than a decade run mostly virtual anyway. So we had uh, embraced the Microsoft technologies um, and a couple of I mean, other consumer technologies for sure before that and really created a virtual collaboration environment. But what is um at least as important are the in-person conversations. The person that those are the things that are extremely hard to replicate in a virtual or technology-based environment where you can look somebody in the eyes, you can start to build a relationship over time. Um, that has been very, very difficult, um, both in the professional side, but of course also on the family side. So we have a, if you have a family that is globally distributed. Um, how do you engage with people? How do you stay engaged? And how do you keep the coherence, even as a patriarch, how do you keep the coherent in the next generation together? So I said, my oldest son is living in, uh, when it started, was in Amsterdam. Now he's living in, in, in Copenhagen. So how do I make sure I'm in Seattle? So how do I make sure that I'll bring all of these different pieces together on an ongoing base? Um, that is one of the key challenges. Um, you ask, uh, Richard, you ask what, what's helping. I think it's um, a lot of good processes for organizations in general, for co cooperations, have been documented, I think, over the last uh, decade. And a lot of them are actually based, I think, uh, what you've seen in long-lasting family legacy organizations, um, families that have been over I guess, 100, 150 years built um, and preserved wealth, I think, and giving it generation to generation. I think those those structures have been proven quite successful. Um, I think it's interesting to hear from people like Nia how important um, it is to bring your children early into the business, to making sure that you are uh, getting them excited about what you are doing, you're, but also you're making sure they can count on each other um, in a time of need, right? Who has their back? How can they relate to each other? How can they communicate? Communicate to each other. I think those are key things. Um, one of the things that is important, I think I mentioned, I touched briefly, is wealth protection and preservation. I think if you look back more than a couple of decades, you realize things are changing on a consistent base. So if you have created wealth for your family, how do you make sure that it's still there a couple of decades out, but also a couple of generations? And really creating that mindset, I think, in the whole family unit. If you haven't gotten it from your parents, how do you make sure that the next generations are are aware of that? I think that's a lot of that's a lot of um, on the top of mind for people, especially here in the U.S. and the Western world, where their wealth has been created over the last two, 20, 30 years and not over the last two hundred years. Again, looking at a European perspective, where families. Um, history is really important. Like my own family, we have documentation until I think 950 or something. So where um, our ancestors were taking over some castles at one point in time. Um, and I know somebody is a general in the 30 year war in 1651, Ernst Albrecht von Eberstein. So there's a lot of legacy you can look after. Having said that, um, a lot of wealth in the technology space has only been created in the last couple of decades. And really, um, we're struggling all, I think, uh, bringing these values together. Uh, thanks, Mark. I think it's challenging, uh, but I think India can learn a lot because we can leapfrog uh, what Europe and America has done and uh, get onto the right side of it. Thanks for sharing about how wealth needs to be preserved. And Europe is a good example, actually, where they have preserved it over decades. And I, I think Japan is also a great example. I'm reading a lot of Japan where they've conserved wealth for so many companies are 500 years old, etc. So uh, let me come to Tatsuya now. Uh, uh, how does the future of family business look for Japan in view of the current pandemic, digital disruption that is happening, business transformation taking place, or any new asset class emerging, as you can see it from where you sit? Yeah, that's 
Yes, uh, th uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, um, in the current pandemic, uh, actually, you know, greatly affects on the Japanese, uh, you know, rich family uh, and the family offices. Uh, in a positive way, uh, actually, they are increasing their assets uh, more and more. But in a negative way, um, their sons, daughters, or their, you know, the offsprings, um, you know, have a tendency to, you know, uh, not, not, you know, succeeding uh, their father's mother's business, but uh, changing their uh, business to the, to the financial uh, based business. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's a, uh, uh, it may be a good trend, uh, but the, you know, originally speaking, um, you know, the Japan has many, many manufacturer company like Sony, uh, mm -hmm. maybe 70 years ago, or Sony, you know, founded. And that is, uh, you know, I, that is the, the so-called IT company, but the, it's still a manufacturer company. And the Japanese people or have a tendency tends to respect that kind of business, uh, not for you know. On the other hand, Japanese people dislike the financial or business or digital business. It's maybe deeply rooted into the uh, Japanese history. So, so uh, backing on the history, for example, um, the the oldest companies. The top ten oldest companies in the world, uh, we have seven in Japan, and out of seven, it's four is the uh, carpenter company, uh, which is especially for the uh, shrine or temple or something. We call it a miraiku, uh, and the another three is the uh, Japanese old style hotel. We call it a ryokan. Uh, so that is a, how, how do I say, it? it's a symbol of the Jap symbol of efforts or symbol of business, uh, historically in Japan. Uh, I think that's why, uh, Japanese people generally, uh, don't like the financial or, you know, financially talking or financially, digitally talking, something like that. But the, um, you know, the 10 years ago, we, uh, tsunami disaster hit, hit Japan. And it is one of the reasons why the, you know, we are now on the Tokyo Olympics. And the, uh, after the, after the tsunami disaster, Japanese family, uh, I think the, um, they, uh, aware, uh, you know, oh, it's very, very important to think about the, you know, succeed their assets or su uh, to think about financial matters. Uh, it's just simply because life is short or something and they are aware that uh, life is short something. So, <clears throat> um, uh, but the, uh, you know, we don't have a, you know, a basic, you know, uh, financial education system uh, because of the history. Or nor the you know or we don't have a you know the how do I say how how to handle the succession system. On the other hand, the Japanese government maybe as you know or has a very very severe restriction started uh, these five four years. For example, or I have a um, visa uh, living in Singapore. And five years ago, or you know, Japanese government, uh, you know, uh, start to levy uh, taxes who those who are you know living abroad. Um, so so we have to pay the when I, when when we are going out uh, abroad one tenth of our assets beforehand, or something like that. So uh, it's you know, or more and more <laughs> severe uh, in the surroundings. So, 
Or oh, anyway, I uh, I am looking forward to uh, talking about talking uh, with you about the how does it how Japan or maybe a uh, you know uh, the Schubert's talking uh, about the old generation uh, how you know how to you know overcome the uh, old customs or it's good maybe it's good maybe but the, we have to go forward to the new. Uh, you know, ideas or new generations. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark, can I come to you? You are a person who's done a lot of work on crypto. So, and as mm-hmm. we have seen, crypto has become a very intrusive asset class. Mm-hmm. Could you kindly throw some light on uh, this, considering the work you have done, extensive work and uh, meetings you have done in this area? Um, glad to, Richard. So, as I said, I've been in the technology space for 30 years, and uh, after I left Microsoft, I started broadly investing in a var- vast variety of areas. Uh, traditionally, real estate, of course, stu- uh, st- early stage startup investment in general, a uh, variety of industries for sure. Um, but I got quite fascinated with this concept of uh, Bitcoin and uh, trying to figure out what's going on early on. So I was spending actually some time in China with the where some of the development happened at that time around mining, um, connected, of course, a lot with my European uh, friends in that space as well. And what really brings it all together, I think if you listen to Ray Dalio, he looks a lot on wealth preservation over the long term. You look at economic cycles, you look at devaluation of currencies from the Dutch golders to the British pound, um, when is the time of the US dollar ending? Um, and I think if you look at long term history, and I think um, you put it quite nicely in Japan, Japan has a very, very long culture, like some of the companies are very, very old. Um, how do you preserve this? And it's uh, traditionally investments in real estate, um, gold, of course, and trying uh, diamonds, I think, because they're more mobile. Um, but it's really trying to figure out with the, in a changing world, how can you preserve the value that you have been created? And the more and more I understood about Bitcoin itself, um, I realized that it is it's starting to play a role where it is working like gold, but it's just so much more efficient than actually owning gold. Um, the transactions are much faster. You don't have to carry it uh, in, in heavy weights around the world. Um, it is really completely, uh, completely mobile. And then and it's interesting over the last five, six years. So I was trying to explain the world of Bitcoin to a good friend. I remember in a, a Chinese restaurant in the art district of Beijing, uh, the former general counsel of Microsoft China there. And he said, yeah, but I'm helping this Russian Canadian kid to put together a foundation in Switzerland called the Ethereum Foundation. So we looked at the second asset in 2015, 2016, just very early and see what's happening there and really seeing the potential of building complete systems on top of it. I know most people are still starting to look at it. My friends at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, they are now officially embracing and said, we can't stop it anymore. Our high net worth individual investors want to go into that space. So we need to be able to have these conversations. But the actual innovation is happening now so quickly and so fast um, that it's really hard for them to stay on top of it. Um, but it's not only the technology and the wealth and wealth preservation, it's also security. How do I make sure that I'm actually securing those assets, not only for myself, but also for the next generation? What happens? We mentioned COVID. If uh, somebody who is deeply involved in that space dies. So we have to not only think about our documentation for very complicated corporate structures in general. How do you have the right attorneys? How do you have the right finance people? They're actually making sure all of these things are well documented so they can go generation to generation. Now we're adding a technology component in addition to that, that the vast majority of the traditional, very experienced and good advisors are not even remotely capable of even understanding the problems. Not having solutions is a different one, but not even understanding the problems that are coming with this. Um, the security issues that are coming with this, but also the flexibility. I think if we are not only thinking about a couple of years ahead, but five, 10, 20 years, generational wealth preservation, um, 
it is one cornerstone that has a huge potential if it is managed correctly. And again, I don't want to monopolize our conversation, but I'm happy to follow up with uh, anybody. I mean, I'm getting invited to our investor groups and family office events in Davos on a regular basis to have these conversations. And I know there's lots and lots of questions. And in a group of friendly people like we're here, very open to talk about uh, all the things that are that are happening under the hood. I think you took the ghost out of crypto, out of Bitcoin, and I think you have made it an interesting asset class for many more people to look at it because people are scared of it. But I think you've taken that out by saying it is efficient, it is much faster, it is mobile, and there is also security and it's wealth preservation in the long term. And, uh, it absolutely is, especially if you look at inflation where we are. We can argue about what the inflation numbers are, if it's really yes. 2% or if it's 4.5%, or if I'm looking yes. at the sell it at the supermarket that has gone up 30% already over year over no. year. So um, cash is trash. Apologize. That's what Ray Dalio said. I'm just quoting. Um, so yes. how do we make sure that uh, if we're healthy today and our children and families are wealthy today, um, that they are still in the same position 10, 15 years from now. And I think that's one of the key tools we can use there. You've given a new thing. Uh, earlier I heard cash is king. Today I heard cash is trash. So yeah, I'm just <laughs> voting. I'm just yeah, 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 voting yeah, earlier. Good. You put it quite I'm nicely. Good. But thank you. It's good to yeah. come uh, to make such statements. Uh, 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 Tatsuya, can I come to yes. you? Uh, yes. Japan, you spoke about having some very stringent policies. So how do the Japan government policies and tax structure impact the high net worth individuals, family offices, and how are they dealing with it? Yeah, actually, I, uh, I have many you know, high net worth uh, individuals, clients uh, on my business, uh, as well as family offices. And I personally, uh, one of the directors of a family office of my you know, family, um, from my experience, they you know, or they are starting uh, to, uh, you know, or go, starting to live uh, outside Japan and, uh, uh, you know, to transfer their money in Japan to uh, another country anyway, uh, set, uh, by setting up a foundations or, you know, or setting up a trust or something like that. Uh, but the Japanese government are conscious, highly conscious about such, such a kind of movement, and the, uh, maybe will be more and more severe uh, to check. Uh, and uh, and I think the you know Japanese government first have to do the how do I say a policy of the something like a tax amnesty uh, because the we. You know, uh, Japanese high net worth families has a lot of, uh, you know, assets overseas already, uh, but we cannot, uh, you know, uh, make my make our assets coming back to Japan because the, uh, you know, how, how do I say, high, very high tax uh, will be, will be levied maybe. So, uh, I think the the best way of the Japanese government. Or local government is way of uh, you know or increasing a, a tax revenue more and more is that first they have to uh, have a tax amnesty program or something. It's my opinion. Mm. And, and it's hard. Sorry for jumping in here for a second, just because. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard for the governments themselves to even wrap their head around this new world. So, for example, I've, I've just met with representatives of the METI um, about okay. two weeks ago, and they were very mm -hmm. clear, said, yeah, we are starting to understand technologies much better, but we have the finance ministry, we have the exactly. central bank, exactly. and we are not even talking with each other. So we don't mm -hmm. have a joint picture yet what Japan should look like. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that happens in other countries as well. I mean, I've been to APEC frequently, but I think that's very, very similar there as well. Yeah. It does take too long. Mm -hmm. It's a good point you've raised. In some other conference, it came out where governments also need to change post-COVID. And I think you've raised a very good thanks for bringing that out. Neha, can I come to you? Uh, the family business are generally reliant on people, as we've been hearing. You know, it's all about people who are trusted and loyalists for many years. 
and how has technology and new working environment help you navigate through this uh, to make it efficient so uh, yes so it's actually you know uh, in the family business setup is very different from a corporate setup we have people working with us for 50 years 40 years i mean when i was 10 years old there were people in our office and they are still there and i'm like 35 now and so you know this is a special kind of a setup and there's a lot of trust and uh, uh, earlier what used to happen is we uh, never maintained that many documents because your family offices was such that you had a lot of confidential things and you just didn't want to share with the newcomers who were coming into the office and we actually faced a lot of this during this covid crisis because even though uh, they were we've had a lot of trusted resources with us who were 70s and in their 80s and signatories and you know and people and and just the check signing authorities at that those levels and um what we came to realize is that this is not something which works long term and uh, we lost also you know one or two people we also lost in our organization who then we had to uh, manage their work and things like that and luckily for us we had already incorporated some of these uh, online payment systems audit systems and all those things so managing the some of the structures was not that difficult where we could uh, have um, Uh, the setup which was done and it was immediately one user was changed to the other but at the same time you know one realized the need to have technology i think we realized that much more i, I think our, our younger generation in our family we were trying to push it for a while but it it took you know it takes a little bit of time for you know for these things to uh, to, to for everyone to understand uh, how important this is and i think for the for going forward uh, i feel that you know we even in our family office setups where we have all these people but one can't just rely on them because you know we have legal teams you have lawyers you you uh, and i think we there has to be i mean of course these kind of documents can't be shared on the general web or on emails but we need to create uh, technology in in terms of all the uh, secretive spaces online or on the web where one can one can store these things because you overnight lose people this is not like succession this is not like general succession you know you lost uh, we had like suddenly one person is there and there was no time to take his workload and bring it to another person uh, it had to be done overnight i found myself working for one particular job role somebody was doing contracts with that's a very senior uh, a person it took me like a month to manage his work myself almost because he was doing confidential work when we lost this person and then now i have this junior person managing it and now we've all settled so these are a lot of learnings for us that even though uh, in even in a family office setup uh, there needs to be a very much more of a thinking on technology and how we plan and execute and uh, manage these type of role in such pandemics So, yeah. But it's great, Neha. You were earlier also sharing with us how technology enabled you to run your business smoothly, and you're not in any single country. You're you're like yeah. living in a, in the plane or in a suitcase, so uh, traveling all over the world, and you're still managing these large businesses. It's really commendable, and thank you for sharing some really good insights with all of us. Uh, Shiva, can I come to you? Is there any advice yeah. you can give us uh, on uh, how can we do a successful family succession planning? that can help in wealth creation which mark was talking a lot about thanks richard i think what mark said was very important the world the wealth preservation i think the creation of wealth is very important the word creation is uh, want to be focused on that the growth of the existing wealth and profit and when families start creating the wealth they have to ensure that they have to ring fence the entire thing one of the most preferred method of managing the legacy wealth generation after generation is by forming trust i think all of us know that the trust process is very important the journey to trust are consist of family members experts like chartered accountants the industry specialists the old the government people the sometimes the lawyers as well so it is basically they guide you to ensure that it's so we need to understand what are the benefits of a trust the trust has lot of benefit not only from a taxation point of view as you mentioned as well that the in india lot of we earlier had estate planning which was abolished and there is a rumor that the estate planning is coming back and we see lot of families started creating trust in the last two years the trust tries to safeguard the family interest ensures that the money the the assets which they have in one place and ensures that the succession is properly done during these things the uh, succession planning is very critical when you want to do ensure that the trust has a corpus which will manage the finance of the uh the entire family the family offices 
also needs to create a wealth portfolio which will basically ensures that the uh, ensures that the uh, the money grows one after the other i would like to give some examples which we, which these portfolios have so one is the activities when they when a when a business trying to when a family business wants to transform the digital like uh neha said that they had been transforming their old businesses to digitization and other things they need a lot of money they need additional capital sometimes this capital is not their excess in the family business so what they do they go to the trust and say that can you lend the money how do they do they they ask for money not they they don't get it free they also have to pay interest the advantage is if they go to the bank it takes time you have to give collaterals but on the other hand if you go to the family trust they can give you the money which you deploy and try to get new you can to expand it and then you return the money it not only increases the business but also the family assets goes up another example i would like to say that the next generation wants to always go into new businesses but the old generation as i mentioned earlier that they would like to stick to their old businesses don't want to take any risk because as you know it is risk means uh, when you do a risk there is a question of you might not get the money back you will lose all the money so they do not want to do that but gni part of the corpus is used for that purposes and partly used for growth of the uh, growth of the business sometimes it is on the ancillary aspect may not be suppose you are doing a business on a particular type and there is a side business which can help the growth of this original business then the new generation comes in and tries to expand that the other areas which the fund is trust can help in wealth, uh, wealth creation is they invest in new age new age businesses the startup which mark talked about the uh, they invest in startups the venture funds the electronics the zomatos of the world which in india a lot of money is being getting and lastly these funds are also used for the purpose of legacy branding because sometimes you need to spend money on certain csr activity by which you maintain the legacies the branding the green activities which is now becoming more common i would like to hear that the corpus has to be efficiently managed for the wealth creation very important it is very important that you need to ensure that the money if it is drawn it is returned back to the trust so that they can be deployed not only it grows the business but also employed in future risk in case like the pandemic there was few about a year or so when there were not too much of growth happening in the business but the these monies are used to ensure that your maintenance you maintain the <clears throat> harmony and everything for the employees are not disturbed so you do that so these are the things i would like to say that in conclusion i would like to add that the succession plan has become more important during the covid and the unplanned entry of our the question is now that the covid has covid into uh, believe that the people do not do, uh, they do not want to draw the wills earlier the people would say let's do it later we don't need to do it now but now with this covid coming in everyone is rushing to make their wills i really noticed in last two years i have been doing helping lot of clients who wanted to make their wills and ensure that they they ensure that the risk is reduced that's yeah. all i wanted to do thank you thank you Thank you, Shivaj, for some very good input that you have given us. And I would like to also thank all the panel members for your valuable insights uh, and uh, uh, for your time also. And uh, appreciate the audience who were listening in. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, goodbye, everybody. And stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.